hör mig inledningsvis. Det vi ska göra nu när vi har fyllt på med både, oh sorry in English, what we're going to do now when we have refilled our systems with both caffeine and energy. We said we're going to go and dig in deep into the green pilot project. And we will first have some, what to say, theory and some presentations in this room. And then we will end to go out and see the boat and the engine itself. And that's a bit of a logistic challenge because everyone can't go on at the same time, but you will manage that. And afterwards, after we have been out and seen the boat, that will merge into lunch. And then we will meet back here again at two o'clock sharp. And I know it's a really good sign when it's hard to get people back into the room because it's a lot of talking. That means that you have a lot of interesting discussions and you will have plenty of time to do that again during the visit at the boat and then also during lunch. So when we end in here, we go see the boat and then we come back for two hours. But as I said, now we're going into the Green Pilot project. And for this, we will have people from Skandinaus Ramne, who is the managing director and also professor of the practice at Chalmers and his crew consisting of Thomas Stenhede, Joachim Bomansson and Patrick Molander, who will guide you through the project <coughs> and then out to the boat. So I give the floor to you, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we will spend about three hours on our favorite topic, which is green pilots. <laughs> uh, and uh, my first block here will talk, I will address a little bit the background why we are doing this. And we are doing it because it's really fun to, to drive a pilot boat, uh, which is true, but it's not really the complete, not, not, not the only reason why we're doing this. Uh, we think that, uh, or we have, in addition to, uh, to have fun driving the pilot boat, we also like to save the world. Even though we can't do it our own, on our own, we think we will, we will hope we will be able to contribute a little bit to, to, that, to that side. Uh, um, our intention is to, to address problems. So then the question is, is there a problem? And in, in that case, what is the problem? Uh, and looking at shipping from our perspective, we see that we have uh, we can identify two, two problems. We have the immediate challenge that we need to find a solution to, and then we have the great challenge. And we have been addressing both of those earlier today, both Johanna and Stanley. And, and the immediate challenge that was what well, Stanley was a little bit addressing as well, uh, the, that's the emission. And, and in particular, we can see that the shipping side, we are, we are not really doing our share when it comes to reducing the emissions f uh, based on, on combustion. We are far behind the, the land industry and we need to, to get our act together. Uh, but we do have some excuses we like to use, uh, we should stop that, but anyway, the situation is that the, the fuel, transport fuel used, the majority is used by road traffic. And that's a slice for aviation, and then it's 15% left used for shipping. Uh, and we are very proud because it's 15% of the fuel used, but we do 90% of the transportation work. So that we makes oh, we we feel great about that. And fuel consumption really corresponds directly to the CO2 emissions. So we say, well, we are not bad because we're doing 90% of the transportation work, contributing 15% of the CO2 from transport. And 15% of the CO2 from transport is about 3% in total of the emissions, CO2 emissions globally. Uh, so it's 3%, is it anything to worry about? Yes, I would say so, because 3% is about the same amount of CO2 that a country like, like Germany are, are contributing to. So of course, we need to do whatever we can to get uh, this share down. We need to improve efficiency, we need to look into to different fuels. Uh, but anyway, that's maybe that's part of the immediate challenge. But more important for the immediate challenge is this part, where we can't really say that we are good at all. For the NOx, we, we use 15% of the fuel, we have, we contributed 42% of the NOx, 
and 73% of the SOX emissions and particular matters somewhere in the same range. So of course we have to do, shipping has to do something about this. Uh, and we do. Uh, we have defined emission control areas in the north European waters around the coast of, of the Americas, or North Americas. Uh, there are defined emission control areas where it dictates that there are stricter rules for emissions of SOX and would be NOx as well coming up. So we do something, but it's still, we're falling behind. We are not really up to, to the same level as the land industry, so we need to do more. And certainly we know also need to have a global cap. There is a cap coming up, but it's not, it's still something that we need to, 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 uh, to uh, find a way to, to uh, strengthen or to make tougher rules, tougher restrict, uh, regulations for shipping. And I think that's, it's nothing that the shipping uh, community is against. I think we like to have a chance. Everyone likes to give, be given a chance to be a good guy, to contribute to, to reducing the emissions. But the, the, the commercial conditions need to be in place as well. Uh, so that's the immediate challenge. Uh, the great challenge is then that we see that in order to reduce the, uh, or to stabilize the the uh, CO2 concentration to about 400 ppm, we need to have a drastic break in the emissions of CO2. Uh, and the bad thing is that no, none of the scenarios that have been identified is close to this one. But I mean, that's not a really reason to give up. I think we have to do whatever we can. And I think there is a lot of possible technology that's that should be available, so it's just a matter to unlock them to make us, to make uh, make it possible for us to use the available technology and make it commercially possible and make it possible for the politicians to take the decisions to allow us to use all the technical features we have, all the tools we have. Uh, so we did start looking into this in 2009 in this F-SHIP project. That was a project uh, with a vision of to contribute to sustainable and successful maritime transport industry, one which is energy efficient and has minimal environmental impact. So that was something that quite a few of us were involved with. We had a broad approach to it. We were looking at the emissions and, uh, and, and ways to improve efficiency and ways to improve, to put sails on ships and also of course <coughs> looking to, to alternative fuels. And again, uh, that's where we define these two things that are coming up here again, the immediate challenge and the great challenge. And at the time, the dramatic increase in fuel cost was really helping us because that was helping us to put the focus on energy efficiency and also made it easier when you have high oil prices, the, the, the step to, to go for something alternative like a renewable fuel is not that high. So actually high fuel prices, high oil prices is really helping our development. Uh, this project, <coughs> We did to do something, uh, well, we sort of tried to be sort of organized about this. We were looking at the, what, where, where we got our energy from. And we could see that oil is a big slice. Uh, coal is still a very big slice. Gas is a big slice. So, and we're looking for shipping that we are using about 4,000 terawatt hours. And we said, and it's completely based on oil we could say. So we were looking at an alternative to the oil and we said of course we would like to like, use biofuels. But this was in 2008 and even if things have been improving and the biofuel has been, there's more plentiful biofuels now, we could really, we, we, we said if we want to be realistic about this, we can't really assume that shipping will be driven on biofuels. It's not a realistic scenario. But we have to do something. Going back to coal is not a good idea, but we saw that the gas has some really benefits that, that go from oil-based fuel to gas-based fuel really could help the immediate challenge with emissions. And then we said we look into the, to the great challenge after that. We uh, did this. Many of you have seen it before. I don't know if anyone has understood it. <laughs> <laughs> I will anyway sort of be persistent and, and take you through it a little bit. We had on the left side, we had the conventional fuels based on crude oil. We had the destillates that the better ship owners or the ship owners that has to are using. And then 
if you don't have to, and if you're just running on based on cost, you use the residuals, the heavy fuel oil. It's a good product for shipping, it's cheap, it's very energy dense, so it's, and it's, it's a trick to handle it, but th th we are good at that on the shipping side. So we are taking care of this part that no one else is right to take care of. And the consequence is that we have a lot of SOX emissions, a lot of uh, NOx as well, and particular matters. At the time, 2009, natural gas was really something that was promoted very heavily. We saw it as very interesting, but we also identified the problems with, with uh, uh, liquefied LNG, liquefied nat natural gas, because it's a complex system. There is a, there is a very established way to handle it, but it doesn't say it, that it's not complicated. So bring it on, on board a ship, it's, it's, you, it's required to have a lot of quite complex uh, installation and equipment on board and also the logistic is, is quite cost intense when it comes to build up the distribution chain. So there was some limitation. But anyway, it was based on gas, which we thought was a good idea. But then we identified that from gas, another way to liquefy the gas is by making methanol. And then we thought, of well, methanol, could that be used as a, as a fuel in a combustion engine? And we realized, after a while, it's a great fuel for combustion engines. So this is really where we sort of started our interest in methanol. And the thing is that we saw that, we didn't know very much, but we, are, we are notified, noticed that the syn gas is the common thing for methanol and for a lot of other fuels. So we could produce any other fuel from the syn gas, why we choose to produce methanol, we think, is why well, that is the best option, is it more energy efficient. The losses, conversion losses, are less if you go for methanol than synthetic or uh, Fischer-Tropp diesel, for example. So that's the benefit of methanol. And with having this syngas, we could look upstream and see, look at, yes, we can produce it from coal, but we can also produce it from biomass, municipal waste, anything that contains a carbon molecule, or carbon uh, atom, uh, and then of not only that, we can also produce it from solar, hydro, wind, any primary energy source we could produce uh, methanol. So there was a versatile uh, energy carrier we could see. But then of course we also noticed that we have other alternatives, we have the ethanol from grain, we also have the things that solar is a great thing now coming up, the HVO and the farm, so everything is on this palette. But we thought that for shipping, the methanol path was a really interesting one to follow. <coughs> and we didn't really come up with all our uh, the conclusions ourselves. We have a good guide here with this George Ola, who died earlier this year, but he's a uh, Nobel Prize winner in, in uh, chemistry. So, and he has put a lot of thoughts into this. And we have a good relation with his colleague, Soraya Prakash. So it's uh, actually very stimulating. So, this turned into a number of uh, interesting projects. Uh, we had the F-ship projects, turned into another project so we identified uh, by the uh, paper pulp manufacturer had interest to put, to produce his own fuel, and that didn't materialize. But anyway, Stena was very interested in this as methanol as an alternative to LNG, so that gave us the chance to do spirit, where we equipped uh, the Stena uh, Conray with auxiliary engines. We had a <coughs> workshop, Promsus, at the time because then we had attracted quite a, f a little interest uh, internationally. We had a Promsus workshop where we gathered a lot of competence into Gothenburg and we learned more and we could sort of get more people involved. And we also had the chance to do this Stena Germanica project, uh, which I assure, assure you haven't seen many times, but anyway, this was the breakthrough because it was two, three, four large Wurzeler four-stroke engines that we did convert to methanol. We didn't do it, Wurzeler did con this, this conversion. Scandinavs, we did a lot of this uh, other ship system, the concept design of the tank, the pump room, uh, the, the, the nitrogen system and such. So there was a um, um, challenge to do this because methanol is a low flash point liquid. The liquid, the flash point is 11 degrees and 60 degrees is normally the low point, the lower limit for what you can have as marine fuel. Uh, but there is nothing that can't be done so there are alternative fuels and there are different ways to do this if they're not 
prescriptive rules, you can always have an argument, or you can have a discussion, and you can do your risk assessment, and you can, quite in a quite good uh, way, to have a discussion with authorities how to make alternative designs. So that's something that I think it's worth to remember that the lack of rules is not the reason not to do things. There is actually even a lot of possibilities and opportunities to do things a new way. But you need to be, of course, everyone should be aware that we need to make, to have safe, safe ships. Uh, the next, at about the same time, we had this front shipping. Uh, seven product tankers, 50,000 tons, installed MAN engines, liquefied gas engines that was running on methanol. Uh, two of them is operated out of Gothenburg. They are running on. They have methanol as uh, in the cargo, and they can run on methanol in the engines. And by that, we felt that we had sort of done our part or contributed to the development of the large segment shipping. So then we were looking into the next into the next segment, and then we said, Let, let's look into the smaller segment. And also at the time, the, these concepts were based on fossil methanol. At the time, it was cheap than the oil fuel. Then the oil dropped <coughs> often price and no one really has a, there's no commercial reason to, to uh, run on methanol. So that sort of is bad because then it's sort of, we don't have that leverage to do the development. But anyway, we saw that what's remaining is the environmental benefits and in particular if you run on renewable methanol, then we can see that there is need to be an interest from the uh, from the governmental financed operations to sort of take the lead and to do the development and to help us to, to find alternatives. So we approach uh, both the Swedish Maritime Administration and the Swedish Transport Administration, Trafikverket uh, and Färjeredriet, who sort of, where we define new projects. One is this summit project, this is the color painting of a ferry, I think. Uh, it's a sustainable marine methanol where we do design work. We do a design of, a f we have done a design, conversion design of a road ferry converting it to methanol. And the interesting here is that now we are down into engine size of 12, 13 liters, which is truck engines. So we are down, down into where we have more, if you're looking in the large segment of shipping, you have a handful, less than a handful of, of, of engine suppliers. When you're down in this segment, you have hundreds of suppliers of, of these type of engines. Uh, and we have a number of them in Sweden, or at least two. Uh, so this is very interesting to see how we can con work with these truck-sized engines, which in this application is, is marine engine, marinized engine, and, and, and see how we convert that into methanol. This is a design project, whereas the green pilot project, which uh, we will sort of continue talking about my colleagues, uh, for, for a while, uh, but this was really an opportunity for us to sort of test our ideas and we had a, a very good uh, partnership with, with the Swedish Maritime Administration who gave us, or gave the project this pilot boat and also we got some funding to make the conversion of this and also to show that we operated on renewable methanol. Uh, green pilot in brief, we started in March 2016, we did a design for the first half year, we uh, did some tank and system installation for the sec next six months. From March we installed the engine and now we have sea trials. We went up and down to North Shipping in Oslo without any problems on the methanol system, so methanol engine, it really uh, runs really nice. And we have there is a, a, one engine installed and we will have another engine installed by the, uh, after the summer and do some further tests. Uh, yeah, well, practice, no one is interested in that. But in some pictures we will get back to that. At the boat itself, bunkering, that's the second engine. Uh, but anyway, well, then again, why methanol? We think methanol is plentiful, available globally, and could be 100% renewable. Methanol is compliant with increasingly stringent emission reduction regulations. Uh, current bunkering infrastructure, infrastructure needs only minor modifications to handle methanol, and there we mainly compare with LNG. We see that the going for methanol is, is sort of 
piece of cake compared to setting up infrastructure for energy. And the conversion cost, again, if we compare to anything else, the conversion cost to, to, to convert an existing ship to methanol is, is reasonable. And then again, if we look further, we, we think that fuel cells, we, we agree, fuel cells will come, we don't know when. And we, we think it's too early to give up the combustion engine yet, we need to improve our work with that, but certainly we are prepared for fuel cells. And another important thing is that comparing things, we see that liquid energy, stores, energy stored in liquid shape is very energy dense. 180 kilo methanol, which is 200 liters, that's compared to 7,000 kilos of lithium ion batteries. <coughs> so it's sort of, and on, on a ship, uh, we, have to, the, the, we have a penalty of weight. So it's, it doesn't, to me, make a lot of sense to put in a load, to try to make an, a light ship with, with sophisticated material, and then we put in seven tons of, of, of batteries if we can have 200 kilo or 180 kilos of methanol. That's a, that's sort of uh, certainly a benefit of, of the liquid. And again, recharging. Uh, we know that Stena, we can, short, we can load 200 tons of methanol per hour, which is actually one gigawatt. Well, this is one gigawatt hour. So if we do it in, in one hour, the actual power we put into the ship is one gigawatt. And electric ferry, if we, if we, charge, if we can charge you in one megawatt, it's really great. It's not, they have to do some good stuff there. So this is a thousand times more faster to, to refuel or recharge. Which means that if you have electric ferry, if you have an electric alternative, you might end up in a situation you need to have two, two boats. One that actually operates and one that is charging. But then again, um, methanol, an efficient universal future proof energy carrier that can be sustainably produced in large quantities. And this is how it looks. Can I add something? Like, yes. You should not forget about spills. If you spill your fuel in the sea, yes. like happened uh, not that uh, long time ago with oil, that's called it. This is water sol soluble and biodegradable. Yes. So it's also when you handle it in, in sensitive areas. Very true. We talk. We tend to always talk about uh, air emissions, but certainly the, the emission, the spill to water is. If you have a oil-based fuel, you you have a serious problem if you spill. If you have methanol, you don't have a problem. It it, it will be diluted and it will disappear. Uh, but then again, is methanol all we need? No, of course not. We need, all you, we need to use all renewable energy resources. I think that's what's exactly what Johanna said, uh, in order to replace fossil energy. So nothing can be, we can turn away from anything. And since we have a lot of biomass, we, we should use it. But we should also use the water, wind, solar waves, and geothermal energy resources. We need to find ways to use that. And that's the energy resource. But we also have to identify the energy carrier, the, the best energy carrier for each application. Uh, and then we have online electricity. I, I don't think you can beat that. I mean, if you have a ship, if you have a ferry and you can have a long enough cable, there's nothing that beats that. So of course you should have electricity. We need to use the HVO. Uh, well, <laughs> do that. Uh, we need to use the HVO. Uh, we know it's limited. Uh, it's great to. It's a drop-in fuel. You should use as much as you can in, as soon as possible. But that will not uh, be enough. Not for shipping. Not for land-based transportation. So we need to find. Also use the RME. We need to use the biogas, both compressed and liquefied. We need to use the hydrogen. We need to use the batteries. Uh, and of course ethanol and methanol is will be part of that. So it's uh, it's just a matter. To, to, to sort and to prioritize and put things in the right place. And we think that methanol shipping is a good place where methanol makes a lot of sense. But again, uh, we also need to be careful because uh, alternative fuels, that's one way, and, and fossil free fuels is one way to reduce the, the emissions. But equally important is that we make sure that we use the energy in the best way and we operate in an in energy efficient way. So that was the general uh, aspects. So now I will leave it to Thomas to talk about more specifics. Thank you very much.
Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Thomas Stenhedder. Uh, I have a history of Wurzele for 23 years, and uh, beware now, it will be a lot of technology now. <laughs> Ending conversion. What, what have we done with the endings that we got? <coughs> Bank said that. Now we have chosen method of, as a viewer. And then, of course, we have to look into that fuel. What features do we have? How can we adapt our engines to that fuel? And of course, methanol has a very low setting number. It has a high octane number. And that gives us some information about technology to be chosen. And of course, high octane number gives us immediately opportunity to run the engine as a pre-mixed or auto engine or spark ignited engine, whatever you call it. So that would be the obvious choice from the very beginning. But we started with <coughs> for a diesel engine. And you can run methanol also in a diesel engine by mixing either octane enhancer or you can use pilot fuel for, igni for ignition. So that was the choice we had. Now we started with these previous projects here, the Wurzeles Scandinavos and Stena made a joint project and then we had to do a conversion of an existing diesel engine. And that project was in fact very successful and we learned quite a lot during that period. So we felt very, felt very confident that we could proceed in this direction using methanol as a fuel. Uh, the Scandinavian Spirit project was a precursor to, to Germanica project, uh, and we do, did a lot of testing with the diesel engine to see how we could modify it. But we also learned how to classify the uh, system because the classification is extremely important. Because if we don't solve the rules coming up, uh, then we are stuck. And that was part of that project. When doing these projects, you are not always successful. I would say that. We were not so successful in converting our methanol into a fuel adapted for these smaller engines that we had then. Uh, what did I show? <laughs> we back. We installed two diesel engines and tried to run them on a fuel, which was a mixture of methanol, DME, and water. And that has far too low setting now, so we didn't make that operable perfectly. So the conclusion was that no, we should go for smaller engines with a premixed or a spark ignited engine. That was our choice at the time. Huh? Now we were very lucky because we had two engines all of a sudden. Patrick and jo Joachim, they were, went to China and got in contact with Fitech. They had access to a methanol engine in China. And they said, that, please, Mr. Scandinavos, could you convert another engine in Sweden for us? And so we got an engine from the Giants. Then we also bought a Scania engine, a 13 liter. And all of a sudden, we had two engines to be converted. Which one should we proceed on? And they were basically in the same range, about 12 liter and 30 liter. So we can notice that the Scania was a diesel engine, but we had a very good cooperation with Scania. They had supported us with a lot of components and assisted us with technology information. They also provided us with components for converting that diesel engine into a gas engine also. The Chinese engine, the Wei Chai engine, was already a spark ignited gas engine. So that meant that we have a lot more job to be done on the Scania engine compared to the Wei Chai engine. But you can notice they are roughly the same parameters here. 405 kilowatt diesel. 300 gas, they're roughly the same, the torque, roughly the same efficiency, and here you had a diesel engine with comp higher compression ratio, 16 and uh, versus 12 for the gas engine. 
Now, to convert this diesel engine, we had to do a lot of job on the Scania 1. Of course, we have to do some slight modifications on the engine. You can notice we had to take away, of course, the diesel injection system. We had to, a new wastegate uh, control turbocharger. We have to exchange piston because we, we didn't want to run directly on 16 in compression ratio. We felt that it was a bit too high. Up. So we changed and took the gas pistons and reduced that to 12. We had to do, of course, installing the new cylinder heads with spark plugs, and we have to do also some new camshafts and new valve mechanism. <coughs> the major job for Scandinavos was, of course, they got to have a completely new control system, and we bought an Australian one, which is basically made for a dragster, that type of a, 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 a engine control unit. We had to build a fuel pump unit, we have to design and construct fuel injection modules. We have to do a fuel common rail. We have to design and construct the air plenum. We have to do combustion of the air manifold, throttle load control, base frame, design and construction. Quite a heavy job to be done during winter and spring now. But that was done in our workshop, primarily Patrick sitting here, fixing with the uh, pump unit. And you can notice that we have to dismantle the whole engine into its pieces. Here you can see all the pieces. And here we have the engine on the base frame, dismantled and installed again. So that was a tedious job to be done. The other engine, the Wei Fitech engine was not that heavy because it was already a gas engine. So we could have the spark plugs already installed and all components were in place. But there was still a lot of job to be done because we have to remove the gas injection system, we have to install trotters, new fuel system, and we have to install the cable. You can notice how nicely we got it from the Chinese. All the cabling was pre-made. But we had to do the pump fuel unit Again, the base frame, design and construction of the consoles for installation, new cooling water pump, design and remission control adapters, and so on. Because this engine had to be installed in the vessel. It, we decided to go with the Wei Chai engine into the vessel. The red one is still in our uh, workshop. And of course, when you are converting an engine in this way, you have a completely new control system. And that was, we have to do a lot of mapping of the parameters to be involved here. We have to do with the ignition, the volume efficiency, the fuel injection timing, starting sequences, throttling and lambda control, whatever. And here you can have a picture of what we were controlling during the startup when we made the um, idling test. It was not very sophisticated, but we had a workshop. You can see our cooling bottle here. We had a cooling water. We had our exhaust gas pipe. We didn't use any silencer. And the engine was just running for idling here. And we had the support of the one Stena guy together with Patrick. And here you can see that we also tested uh, idling the uh, Chinese engine. The Scania engine we managed to run in a load test set. It's important, of course, to see that you can run it uh, idly, but you don't get really get full control of it. So we managed to install it on a, a, a test bench at Imatec. We were very lucky, in fact, because we really searched across whole Europe to find a testing place. And all of a sudden, 200 meters away, we had one. <laughs> so we just took the engine on the track carried it down and we prepared it so we can have it on the base frame here it, you can see the uh, uh, instrument for the, for the loading you can see the fuel pumps uh, the guys were preparing the test I assume there is a leakage going on here you know you have to control it but one big advantage with having the spark ignited and is that we can just have a very low pressure on the fuel feed just six bars in comparison to a diesel engine, which is operating on maybe 1,000, 2,000 bars, methanol, maybe 500. And the fuel system becomes a lot easier. And this is the installed engine in the vessel. 
that you received next Friday. These are the test results from the uh, load tests. This is uh, the load. And you can notice here that we get a quite a good torque because torque is important for driving the propeller. And here we achieve with methanol roughly 2,000 newton meters. <coughs> and we had a power output of about three, some 300 uh, kilowatt. Huh? And the efficiency, they are not very well uh, estimated, but we are around 40%. And that's the same what it is for a diesel engine. And we, at this stage, feel quite satisfied with reaching these 40%. It's very interesting to do all these tests and see why, what happens when you have a completely new fuel, uh, how to operate it, what happens when you start it. Uh. And there were some very big surprises we had uh, because we had to inject it very early, we have to ignite it very early, which we didn't expect to be done. But when we had it at these operating points, uh, we felt that now it is running smoothly. We didn't have any knocking, it was running cold. I said to you, when we started it up, that no, 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 it will not start today. It's too far, far too cold outside. We pushed the button, and after a few seconds, it started. It was below 10 degrees. We didn't expect it to start because methanol is difficult to start. We should have, a pre, have it preheated, but we managed to do it. Just show you the efficiency. Uh, you can notice here, these figures are taken from the Chinese tests in China on the way to China and India. And you can notice here that we are around just below 40%. And that we also can meet low emissions below tier 3. Uh, tier 3 tells us 2 to 3 gram per kilowatt hour. But here we are well below NOx is the green one. And we are hovering around 1. Uh, that gives us an expectation to meet the tier three without having any catalytic support. If we want to run an engine as a genset, then we of course would like to run it maximum here. Because if you have a hybrid system, then you should show a charge so you meet maximum efficiency. And that can be done up here. Don't go idly and in low load. Uh, configuration because then the efficiency will drop and that really gives an opportunity for fuel saving in the future if you just make the engine run maximum uh, efficiency. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Thomas? <coughs> How many running hours uh, does this fire? We, we run the vessel up to no shipping. It's 150 nautic miles. Takes you 20 hours. And uh, back again. That means that we have run it 40 hours back and forth slowly. And we have to run it maybe 10 hours additional for our own testing here. So let's say today we have run it 50 hours, something like that. And it has been run how, smoothly. Uh, I mean, because. Uh, like pilot boats, they go some hours every day. Our boats goes on the summertime, it goes intense, intense. No. But then autumn and winter and spring, they don't go no. so much. Can you, you see a problem with that, that they're not running? No. Of course, we have to do a lot more testing. Huh? We, we have to see that we have endurance testing. We have to look at the new oil. We have to see if the wearing and the, I mean, this is the very start of the project, huh? and in order to make that an industrial project, that's a completely bus different business. Huh? But it has started smoothly. We feel confident that this is an opportunity. Uh, Methanol is a very dry, dry fuel, so to say. And you, what, what, uh, what is the difference in the, in the use of lubrication oil? Or, or something? Have you noticed anything? We, we can notice that when we start the ending cold, then some of the methanol will mix into the lube oil. So we can feel the smell a bit of methanol. But when the engine has heated up, then the, we evaporate the methanol out of the lube oil. 
what impact that will have in the long run, that will be remains to be seen now. But as we don't have any sulfur in the fuel, then we, of course we don't have to have the same fuel, uh, low oil as we have in the diesel engines. But there are a number also of issues to be discussed and see what is the wearing and uh, how do we handle low oil in the future. Yes? Did you test the uh, different methanol qualities, uh, especially think about uh, the amount of residual water in these cases, we have had uh, uh, water-free methanol, chemical grade, yeah? and of course we can expect that methanol is a bit hydroscopic, yeah? so there could be water in it, and of course also supplied if we like to say, okay, give us methanol with 5% water in it, it will work quite all right in the end in the such, yeah? but what impact that we have on corrosion, for instance, that has to remain to be seen now. We have just have it open once, and we didn't say anything, we didn't see nothing at that time, but also too premature. Yes. Um, everywhere I come and um, it's being talked about methanol, I see that, that system designers love methanol, but the problem is always the availability of the motor or, yeah, engine. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, what, is your, what is your expectations? Do, do motor manufacturers realize these? Yeah, these hints and, and is something moving on that front? Uh, we have had many discussions, of course, with the engine manufacturers, so, both with Volvo, Scania, and a lot of things. Yeah. We have said that now we take care of this. Uh, we, we feel that the shipping industry needs something, uh, and if methanol is the fuel, as Bank showed you here, we have to do something to the engines. And that was what the Swedish administra uh, maritime administration told us. Okay, go ahead now. Make a project where you use methanol and demonstrate that it is a fuel, a fuel opportunity. Then, of course, the industry has to come and say, yes, it's good, it is bad, we don't bother. It's, it's a next step. Part. But I think that we have to give you the starting opportunity to say that, yes, Germania, two stroke, uh, four stroke diesel, fine. MAN says toe stroke, K. Okay. Scandinavia says small, fine. I think that's a good uh, way of proceeding. I wonder a little, I mean, the know how for building uh, alcoholic motors and uh, alcoholic combustion engine, it must be there somewhere. In, in the 70s, we have seen uh, when the oil prices were high, we have seen programs running uh, alcoholic motors. So, so what, what's why so well, the, the, the difference is that in the 70s, uh, in the 80s, I was involved in that time as well. Uh, I know I'm old enough. <laughs> because then we used methanol or alcohol to replace methanol because we were getting short of oil. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now it's different because now we are looking into the fossil free opportunities. Fossil free methanol can be made in many, many ways. So, so we are, let's say, reinventing something. Yes. I could maybe answer that question. And uh, so in the world right now, there are around 17 million EA high cars. <coughs> so ethanol fuel, a little bit of gasoline. And those are developed from the M8 five cars that we used to use the test programs, for instance, in the US. And they are interchangeable, compatible. I mean, we have been running together with uh, Lumen Technical University, a saw the EA to five on M56. It could probably be run on M8 five. So that technology has been around for 20 years. <coughs> That's my perspective. So actually, it's a policy uh, at the engine manufacturers. It is a controversial for us for our road transportation. I think they probably comment on that as well from Volvo Penta. It's a little bit of a hand and egg problem uh, because uh, as you speak about M85, E85. Uh, ED, ED95, M95, LNG, CNG, uh, and we develop products for our customer where we have a customer demand. So there is a need for customer demand, but the, uh, as you say, uh, Martin, the know-how is there. Uh, we, we have full respect for Scania and Volvo approach because you are a, a business to run now. Yes. Yes. You have to give my wife pension. <laughs> you have to make profit. <laughs> but we have taken that board 
from the marine administration say, yes, we can, we will do it, and we will show it. Hopefully, someone else will proceed and say, yes, now someone in the shipping industry is doing that. Though. That's our target. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, that's of course a big part of this, uh, this project, the demonstration part, to just to show potential customers that Metamo is a usable fuel. And then we need the engine manufacturers to hook on when there's customers as well. Uh, so we're going to take a uh, step a little bit further from the, from the engine side and look at the design of the uh, conversion of the pilot boat uh, itself. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the design considerations uh, on the boat, uh, the hazards or the potential hazards with methanol, uh, the re regulatory situation, what, uh, what rules we have been uh, working with uh, for this conversion, and of course uh, the design of the vessel itself and the conversion. Uh, so looking first of all on uh, some considerations, uh, we were going into that a little bit uh, earlier with the uh, material compatibility, where methanol is uh, aggressive towards some uh, elastomers, so we have to, to use the right gaskets. And there's a compatibility matrix here, you can see. And it's actually a quite a difference between uh, uh, petroleum fuels and uh, alcohols. Where some uh, some of the uh, gaskets work very well with one, but not very well with the other, and this is of course very simplistic as well. As well, and this is really a jungle. But uh, uh, this is this is really something we need to think about when, when choosing the right components. Uh, but it's uh, 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 important to to think about it. And we also have uh, some issues with with metals, uh, aluminium. Uh, we should we should avoid, and some some steels might be a problem. Uh, if we have a water in the metal. I think uh, looking at from an engine side, uh, it can be perceived that methanol is uh, quite aggressive, uh, but compared to other chemicals from, from that industry, methanol is not really uh, that difficult to, to, uh, to use. Uh, I'm also going to come in a little bit about the hazards. Uh, as, as you know, uh, methanol is toxic. That is something that we consider in the design and we try to, to limit uh, our exposure towards methanol. But we should also remember that uh, diesel and gasoline is quite uh, dangerous as well. But maybe we are so used to it that we don't really think about that. Uh, methane is, as I said, a bit more toxic, uh, whereas uh, diesel and gasoline is more uh, has other health effects. And I think the, the most uh, dangerous part with methanol is probably that it can be confused with ethanol, and that is uh, probably not when uh, using it. But if someone steals uh, fuels, for example, we, we can might uh, think about uh, we should use a bit round to denaturate uh, uh, methanol. Uh, a good thing is, of course, it is not a hazard to the environment. It is uh, soluble in water, it's biodegradable, and it's uh, generally not, not toxic to the environment, just for humans. Uh, flammability is another thing that we consider, and uh, much of the rules and the design of the vessel uh, is really aimed at uh, taking care of uh, these, uh, these uh, exposures. We have the vapor pressure and the uh, flam especially the flammability range for methanol is, uh, is very high. It's from 6 to 36 percent in that air fuel mixture, that is, uh, it is combustible. Whereas uh, diesel and especially gasoline is usually in a, we, we have a rich mixture when dealing with those fuels. Uh, the flame point or the flash point is uh, another issue. It's very low, uh, especially compared to diesel, which is generally about 60 degrees. That means that we have to heat the uh, fuel to this, this temperature before we produce enough vapors to, to start combustion. Uh, gasoline is, of course, much lower, but that, that's not the fuel we use in uh, commercial shipping. So that's why diesel is the compar comparison. Uh, we can also use these numbers to uh, calculate the uh, potential uh, Temperature, temperature range where the fuel could be uh, combustible inside a fuel tank. And then we get uh, between 11 and 40 degrees about that. About that uh, we can have a you know, closed container with methanol that uh, has a uh, combustible atmosphere. Uh, gasoline is uh, about 10 degrees centigrade, it will be too rich to combust, and diesel below 60 degrees will be too lean to, to, uh, to be possible to ignite. Uh, and this is uh, one, one reason where we use. Uh, nitrogen in the fuel tank, for example, to, to limit, uh, or to, to stop this danger. Uh, we should also remember that there are some positives with methanol when it comes to flammability. And that's a much higher, a lower heat release, so much less uh, heat will be uh, produced uh, in case of fire. Uh, 
and look at the radiation from our pool fire with methanol. And it's a two square meter pool fire uh, with methanol compared to M8 and M15. This is 15% uh, methanol and 75% uh, heptane, or similar to gasoline. And then at four meter, uh, four, two meter away from a, a four meter uh, pool, we have 2.6 uh, kilowatt uh, energy radiation. So, uh, so we have 18 uh, for, for the M15. And, and then in relation to this is uh, about five kilowatts. Then you got the burning, burning uh, sensation of, uh, of the skin. Uh, uh, that's 10, uh, sorry. Uh, five is uh, not uh, hazardous. 40 is uh, instant death. So you see that we have a lot less uh, uh, radiation from a methanol fire. Which is positive. Uh, we also need to take care of uh, the flame, of course. It's not really visible, which is a good thing uh, when it comes to emissions. We also have no smoke, smoke uh, but we can't use smoke detectors to detect uh, metal fire. And this is a picture to the right. You can see an ordinary camera, and to the left is a heat uh, camera. Uh, so we can't use smoke detectors uh, for metal fires. Uh, we can use heat detectors. Uh, we can also look at the radiation from a metal fire. Uh, and this is uh, different uh, fuels. There's a diesel fuel and there's, uh, below is uh, methanol and ethanol. And what you can see is uh, that we have the same uh, IR radi radiation from uh, methanol and ethanol. Uh, we can look at, and when using IR detectors we're usually looking at uh, different peaks. So here we can see the CO2 radiation and uh, also uh, the radi radiation peak uh, with the water uh, forming in the uh, combustion. And conclusion is that, well, that we are open new, but we can use triple band IR detectors uh, that has been tested for ethanol, but it's very important that they have been tested for ethanol. Uh, and we also going to say a little bit about uh, fire suppression. Uh, foam systems work very well, but it's important to have uh, uh, alcohol resistant foam, because otherwise the, the foam will uh, break down. Uh, water mist, which is usually usual on uh, large ships for local protection. Uh, it's very good at containing a methanol fire, but it will not uh, extinguish it. Uh, gas fi fire, fire gas fire uh, systems, for example CO2, work very well with metal, but we need a little bit higher concentration. And there's a matrix uh, as well with different different uh, different agents. Uh, we, can, we can of course extinguish metal fires with water, which is a good thing and powder extinguishers as well. This was very fast about uh, the fire, fire part, but yeah, I, I just want to show you that uh, it's really something we have been uh, thinking about. And this is a very good report uh, that you can uh, download from that Rice did, studying uh, metal fires uh, against uh, the testing procedures used for, for marine uh, equipment. Uh, so they use the same procedures and the same test, uh, uh, test system. So when it comes to the methanol, methanol use on board of the pilot vessel, or in shipping in general, we have uh, basically uh, the set of rules is that it is an important part for shipping is the SULAS uh, convention from IMO. And uh, corresponding on, on the Swedish side, uh, we have the Swedish statues from the transport agency. But this is really the flag state rules. And the pilot boat is of course too, too, uh, too small to be via IMO ship, so we have to look at the Swedish transport agency uh, statues. Uh, which I actually learned that they are not really applicable, uh, applicable as well, but they are the closest thing that we have to look at. Uh, both the, these regulations set uh, limits on uh, flash point, a minimum flash point of 60 degrees and uh, 43 degrees. And as we know, methanol has uh, 10 degrees, so we're quite a bit lower. Uh, but there are uh, alternative design routes where you, what, what we do, we do uh, risk assessment uh, work to show that we have an e equally safe, uh, safe system. Uh, there are some rules for low flash point fuels as well, or at least they are coming. Uh, on the inter international side, we have the, have the IGF code, uh, which, as today, take care, take care of uh, LNG use, and the methanol part will be included uh, in the future, but we are still working on that. And also, we have uh, classification rules from uh, Lloyd's and uh, DNB. Also, I think they are working on uh, some Chinese uh, rules. Uh, but, all, but all of these uh, rules, as well as the alternative design uh, rules, uh, really requires a lot of passage work and risk assessment. And that's uh, what we've been doing from in this this project, as well as in the previous project with the Stena Germanica and Spirit. And it's a very, very important step to really uh, think through, through the systems on board. 
So, coming to the fun part, the actual design of the pilot boat. So I'm going to talk about the fuel systems and the uh, tank inertia. Uh, comes that later. Of course, the gas detection is one one method to detect methanol, um, and the, the fire part as well. Uh, so starting off with the fuel systems, uh, we installed uh, two, two new fuel tanks of stainless steel uh, to take care of the material compa compatibility com compatibility uh, issue. Uh, they are four liter each approximately, and they are located in a new tank room on board, which is uh, insulated towards the rest of the, of the, of the vessel. Uh, and in this, uh, this new tank room is uh, special ventilation, it's considered hazardous from a fire safety point of view, which means that all the electrical equipment inside this compartment is uh, explosion proof. Uh, yeah, and we also have uh, solenoid fuel valves to, to always control when the uh, when the valves from the tank is open. And also pressure, pressure monitor and uh, such. And this is how it looks in the pilot boat. The leftmost is the port side tank. Uh, and then uh, the right side there is a picture looking in from the machinery room into the tank room. This is a bolt attached that is uh, always closed during operation. This was during commissioning. Uh, and there you can actually see the, see the fuel valve as well. Well, as a gas detector. Um, so then, uh, another thing of the fuel system is the fuel pumps. As I said, they are separate from the uh, from the engine. So the external fuel, fuel pumps, and they are housed inside a steel uh, steel box inside the engine room. And this box is, of course, the closed towards the to watch the engine room. And this is to, to contain any any potential methanol spillage. Uh, and this system is also very much in line with the regulations for larger shippings, but there, there's a requirement for a separate fuel, uh, fuel pump room. And this is, uh, so to speak, our, our pump room. Uh, so there we have the, the filters and pumps as well, as I said. And this is really the, the location where we imagine that uh, we probably will have leakage, leakage uh, if anywhere. Uh, and this is how the pump chest uh, looks like in the vessel uh, itself. There you can see the hatch uh, in background before towards the tank room as well. Piping, we have a uh, double wall piping uh, inside the engine room just to contain any metal, potential methanol spillage. Um, and these are uh, pre made, quite, quite easy to work with actually. Uh, and the outer, outer wall in this case is, is, uh, a sec works as a second barrier where we have, uh, have a drain towards the pump chest, uh, but we don't have any, any pressure monitoring or uh, ventilation of the angular space, uh, as it would it really be practicable on this, uh, this, small, this small vessel. Uh, bunker connection is another different, uh, uh, important part. And we have used this kind of uh, dry disconnect uh, coupling, which works, works very, very well. And the reasons are really there are several different reasons for this. Uh, from a safety perspective, it's, it's very convenient because we don't have any spillage, which is good both from fire safety, but also as uh, we don't, uh, we try to avoid coming in contact with the fuel. Uh, and they have been working very well. I located on deck there, uh, you can see the, uh, see the, yeah, there's the, the pipe, a uh, hose from the, from the, Bunker vessel towards the bunker manifold, and this is actually our bunker at this time. We have, have a portable uh, IBC tank, one cubic meter, on a, on a on a trailer, and there is a fuel pump as well, a fuel transfer pump. So we bunker it uh, to uh, towards the ship. And this for this size it works uh, well. I should also say that we have uh, approval for this. It's uh, pos perfectly legal. <laughs> Uh, and, and we all have the necessary permissions to handle uh, stor storage and tra transportation of uh, dangerous cargo, uh, methanol in this case, of course. Uh, yeah. uh, when it comes to the tank inertia, and this is really the, the, the dealing with the flammability range of methanol. Uh, for, for larger ships, for example, Steno Germanica, 
uh, draw rules requiring, requiring uh, inertion on, uh, inside the fuel tank. And inertion is really to, to, uh, to prevent any oxygen from being present inside the fuel tank, above the fuel and uh, in the <coughs> empty space, so to speak. Uh, so using nitrogen, uh, we can control the, the amount of oxygen and we can uh, create an atmosphere that is depraved of, uh, of oxygen. So, so it can't really burn, even if we had an, an ignition source, which we uh, shouldn't have, but you never know what happens. Uh, when it comes to, uh, actually, uh, it's, uh, on the international side, it's quite, quite interesting that uh, there are, are requirements of this energy for uh, using uh, methanol as fuel, but it, it is not, at least not uh, right now, a requirement for, for uh, uh, transporting methanol in large volumes. I've heard that it might become a requirement in the future, but as of now. Uh, on the pilot boat we have uh, two, two bottles uh, there, located on deck. With, and we have a, a 150 millibar overpressure inside the fuel tank, so then we have uh, some uh, regulate, regulating the pressure from 200 bars to 2 bars to 200 millibars. Yeah, det har ju, det som sprids mest just nu av Uh, and this is for this reason we also have a PV valve on the fuel ventilation just to, to keep the pressure uh, on the tank ventilation, sorry. Uh, and we have a total volume uh, when full of about uh, uh, 8 uh, cubic meters of, uh, of nitrogen on board, so about 8, eight times we can back here. Uh, I think uh, this is really something that we need to evaluate if we need this, uh, uh, this nitrogen system on, on this uh, size of vessel. Because there is a threshold uh, somewhere between uh, luxury craft and, and to, to study harmonica, where maybe the nitrogen system becomes too complicated to actually use methanol as fuel. Uh, in this case, it works very well. We have the space, we have the, uh, the, the size of ship to, to have it workable. Uh, for a smaller boat, it might be a problem. For um, a little bit larger boat, it might actually be a problem as well, because we need to carry m many bottles of nitrogen. But it, as I said, in this case, it has been working very well. And it, is a, and it is an additional safety feature that uh, uh, we believe that really have improved the safety. Uh, it can, of course, be, be dangerous as well. Uh, nitrogen, if you have a uh, leakage in a containment space. Uh, but as, as, as it is arranged on the pilot boat, this is not really an issue. Uh, I'm also going to say a little bit about gas detection. And this is really the means that we use to detect any methanol leakage. Uh, we have uh, these uh, detectors that detect any vapors of methanol and we get an alarm at 15% uh, LEL and LEL is the lower explosion limit. Uh, so when we have an alarm at 100% then we, then we have a have atmosphere that, uh, that is, is possible to ignite but below that uh, it's too, too lean mixture. Uh, and the, this, uh, we, get, we get these alarm levels but we also have continuous monitoring so we can look at the, the level at all times. Uh, fire detection, as I said, is an important part. We have heat as well as smoke detectors inside the engine room. And we also have a secondary uh, loop on the, on the fire, fire system in the metal tank room, where we only have uh, heat detection. Uh, and we have a CO2 system on board, that is total manual. That's an uh, existing, existing system for this uh, boat. And inside the, the tank room, we also have a secondary uh, uh, secondary system, which is a uh, kind of energy and no Novec uh, system, with, uh, which is an, a gas system as well. And this is uh, automat uh, automatically uh, activated. But this is inside the tank room, and that, that's not a not, not, not location where where we can have personnel. That's why we can have it automated. And this is the same system used on uh, many small measure boats as well. And we have portable fire uh, powder extinguishers on board as well. So looking at uh, everything together, this is a render of the pilot boat. It's a bit dark to, to actually see much, but uh, looking at it, uh, here are the dry disconnect bunker connector, connection, one on each side of the of the vessel. Uh, we have the nitrogen cabinet on deck. And we have the PV valve high on the port side of the cabin, and then in the off we have an existing the existing CO2 system where we have both the bottles and uh, uh, where you re release the agent. Yeah, on board we also have uh, eye, eye, uh, eye wash, just in case you get methanol, methanol uh, in your eyes. Also you have, have uh, 
develop procedures just to, how to how to use how to work with the fuel systems. So, so we uh, yeah just uh, so so to keep uh, keep ourselves and, and try to avoid any any potential accidents. Uh, below deck, this is kind of how it looks uh, on the port side. We have the blue engine. That's the BHI the metal engine. And this is the existing diesel engine. So we're keeping one diesel engine uh, for now just for safety. Uh, as we you heard heard before, that's the one that broke down uh, before. Uh, now fixed. Uh, then looking at the system as a whole, we have the fuel tanks. Uh, this is the, in the uh, tank room. Uh, explosion proof, as I said. We have the double wall piping going from the outside of the tank room. And this is inside the new room. And this is inside the new room. So double piping. We have the pump chest. Where we have the fuel filter. We have the metal pumps. And we have some exposed uh, um, inside the pump chest. We have uh, single wall piping as well, but that's uh, not, not an issue. So we have the outer shell instead to to, uh, to, to sustain metal. And we have the gas detection uh, on the engine, inside the pump chest, and inside the tank room. Uh, for the fire detection, we have a heat detector about uh, here. And we have a smoke detector about here. That's the existing locations for the for this vessel. This is how the engine looks installed in the inside the, the pipe rods. And here you can see the fuel pipe. Here you can see the other fuel pipes. Uh, and what we're going to do is also to to better cover the fuel rail uh, in some manner to to uh, uh, to contain any metal uh, metal spillage. But that's still a work in progress. And this is uh, in the in the cabin. So this is the, where we can uh, monitor all the metal, metal systems, uh, the gas detection, the tank level in the methanol fuel tanks, the pressure in the fuel tanks, and also control the solenoid fuel valves and the stuff. Uh, this is the control box for the VHI engine. Uh, we can see the, well, some engine data and also start it. And then we'll have a small control box for the, for the methanol fuel pumps and uh, fuel valves. And it's not, as you can see, it's not really fully integrated in, into the pipe boat at, at this time. Uh, but but we are also prepared to, to change the engine in the future. Uh, we haven't really decided what systems to keep for that. And, and here you can see it running on 50% uh, methanol, I should say, because one engine is running on methanol, one, the other one on diesel. Uh, I think this is uh, on its way to, to Oslo for, for Nord shipping uh, two weeks ago. And I think that's what they're prepared. <coughs> yeah, uh, regarding this uh, fire extinguisher, the aerosol, have you tested that? No, we haven't tested it. Okay. But, uh, we have uh, looked on some data and we have uh, used that, but it's not uh, really tested. Uh, the CO2 systems have been tested for methanol, mm -hmm. but they are not approved for methanol, but they, are, they have been tested. We have the uh, calculations uh, procedures how to calculate that. Also, another question there, you, you had a lot of pressure from nitrogen. Yes. Yeah. Are you forced to have that over pressure? Or? Well, as in this type of vessel, we have not, not really any specific rules, uh, but uh, generally we have our pressure, and it's also a good uh, way to monitor that we actually have nitrogen in the tank, so we can easily detect if we have a loss of pressure, and we can uh, detect, okay, but then we need, no, there is a failure on the nitrogen system. Yeah, it seems uh, a very expensive way of doing it. It's, of course, it's a bit complicated. <coughs> Components are. Yeah, but have, have you had in mind to, to use like bags? Sorry, fuel bags. Uh, no, not really. We okay. have in other in other projects. We have. Okay. We have, we have okay. a project for for a tugboat, and there we will there will be a retrofit, and that will probably be the solution with. with the fuel. Yeah. Because you, fuel you can bags. have in two steps. You know, if you have fuel bags for the fuel, and you have have a, a bag also for the nitrogen. That goes yes. up and down. I think if we have fuel ladders, I don't think we will have to have nitrogen. So, but that's, I mean, that's that would be the next step. Okay. And we, because the, we are, we are really looking, taking it step by step, and we see that that's an obvious way where we okay. need to improve or simplify the design. Yeah. Uh, at least uh, I, I would think that was a very expensive way of doing. Yes, but but we also have to consider to have the nitrogen system, but. <coughs> to reuse the nitrogen system. Yeah, because yeah. when you fill up the tank, yeah. you would push the nitrogen system into a container and then yeah. you would reuse it. Yeah, yeah. That would yeah, that was awesome. yes. yeah. And I really think that, in particular, the nitrogen system is one thing that we really need to evaluate. So. 
to figure out if, if we need it or, or what alternatives uh, there are available. Thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, do you think that you can somehow uh, start have an idea of using the engine exhaust as a uh, as a inert gas so that you can use your nitrogen as a backup and use inert gas directly from your fuel system? Yeah, but that's one of the things we were uh, discussing uh, we, we could use, but uh, at this time it would really be, become uh, a bit too complicated. But for, for future system, that is one, certainly. Uh, before you answer, A safety question: Do you use EX proof lighting in the uh, engine room or whatever? Well, the, the engine room is not uh, e EX uh, an EX area. Okay. It's only the, the fuel uh, storage room. Well, there we have no storage room. Do you use EX proof lighting? There? Yeah, we don't have any lights in that room. It's a very small compartment. Oh, okay. And when, when we have need access to it, we open the hatch and we get the lighting from the engine room. But then we can uh, make sure that we don't have any, any explosion atmosphere in that room when we open it. Okay. We would use LED lights. Thank you. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Okay. Then we'll give the word over to Patrick Melander. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Can you hear me? Oh. Yeah. I can't hear myself. So. <laughs> but, okay. um, so my name is Patrick Melander, and I will introduce you to our work with the environmental performance. Uh, I will start with just some, some on a very basic level, like talking about the, the emissions which we are trying to, to uh, decrease, uh, and then I will go through some uh, some results, some future work, and the twist with uh, some some results you maybe have not, uh, you yeah some, some things you you have not thought of, we can say, which will. Uh, I will present in the, in the end of this presentation. And after this presentation, uh, maybe someone wants to have a word, but uh, we should we like to show you the, the pilot boat, as, as you have told, told, told us before. So, what impacts, in what impacts the emissions? Uh, we have talked about this earlier today. Uh, to, 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 to transport a vehicle, or transport a boat, uh, requires a high proportion of auxiliary system and the operation. And of course, all these things will impact the, the emissions. And we can, we can use more, more energy efficient uh, parts, so more energy efficient hull, more energy efficient systems, and operate it more, more efficient, and there, thereby lower our, uh, lower our impact of the emissions. Uh, if we have a combustion engine on board, uh, we will uh, burn fuel. A uh, fuel will result in SOX, NOx, CO2, some methane, silicon, particulate matters, etc. Some, some other. But these are the these are the main uh, main emissions which we are talking about. Uh, this SOX uh, depends on the sulfur content in the fuel. Uh, this means that if you have SOX, if you have sulfur in your fuel, you will have SOX in your emissions. And uh, if you have no uh, so uh, sulfur in your fuel, you won't have any any sulfur emissions. The NOx depends on the combustion process. Uh, we have a diesel process, uh, like the compression ignited. We have the spark ignited process. We can control the air flow and uh, which goes into the engine, and the, the the temperature and the time that the air um, is is exposed uh, to the combustion will create more or less uh, NOx uh, due to the combustion. Uh, CO2 emissions uh, will mainly, it, it has a direct relation to the fuel used. Uh, methane slip, uh, it has to do with the, with the uh, uh, combustion design, basically. Uh, so we, we can eliminate that with a, with a good design. Uh, we skip. We're, we're, when when uh, talking about the CO2, we have to we have to study the whole uh, the whole footprint all the way from the feedstock to the to the output shaft and, and here as we heard before methanol is a is a good good choice um, sulfur content in fuel uh, 
The international shipping allows a maximum sulfur content of 3.5% uh, in the fuel. Uh, from 2020 to 2025, international shipping will allow 0.5% sulfur. Within the SEC area, maximum 0.1% sulfur corresponds to uh, 1000 ppm. Heavy duty truck, the Euro 5 and Euro 6, uh, here the limit is 10 ppm uh, sulfur. And as you can see here, it comes the really interesting part with methanol as a fuel, because methanol only contains maximum 0.5 ppm uh, of uh, sulfur in the fuel. So you can see from this picture that uh, we will have a low uh, sulfur, uh, or a low SOX emissions from a methanol powered engine. NOx emissions, uh, this is something we talk a lot about, um, at least the politicians talk a lot about it today. Um, the, uh, there are mainly one, one, one combustion process commonly used on, um, for marine applications. We have the combustion ignited engine. Uh, excess of air uh, com in combination with high temperature will give us more uh, NOx emissions. A diesel engine uh, will always run with an excess of air, and therefore NOx will always be uh, created in a, in a diesel combustion process. There are there are ways of treatment systems to lower the uh, the NOx emissions uh, for marine applications. But as we have done in the pilot boat, we use a spark ignited uh, engine instead. We can run it on stoichiometric uh, combustion. This means that we have a, the same amount. Uh, of air as we have fuel, the air to fuel ratio is 1, uh, which means that we, we uh, uh, will have a lower NOx, uh, low NOx emissions. If we use a three-way catalyst, which, may, which is possible when we run a stoichiometric combustion, we can reduce the NOx with 99%. So the, the, the way, the, the configuration of the engine ma and machinery in the pilot boat today gives us really uh, a, the, the uh, technical uh, ground to uh, to lower our or lower our, our NOx emissions, and we believe that using a spark ignited engine instead of a com uh, uh, compression ignited engine will uh, have the potential to to uh, uh, to increase our efficiency. Some figures uh, from NOx uh, emissions. This is uh, methanol in diesel combustion. Uh, Using diesel as a pilot fuel, using methanol uh, as the as as the fuel injected after the diesel. Uh, from Stena Monica, here are uh, only running on diesel, about 10 to 12 grams per kilowatt hour, uh, and when we when the engine is run with uh, with a mix of uh, methanol, it is decreased by 60%. And as you can see, it is within the four to six uh, grams per kilowatt hour. Uh, here is the tier graph from, uh, and, and as you can see, the tier three emission limit regulates the, which is regulated within the emission control areas. We're allowed to, for an engine, for, for the pilot boat with a uh, 2,300 RPM engine, we're allowed uh, to, um, have 1.9 uh, grams per kilowatt hour uh, of NOx emissions. And I can tell you, as Thomas did before, we succeeded at very low RPM, <coughs> with very low uh, loads, power output from the engine. Uh, we have quite high uh, NOx emission to be a, a spark ignited engine. Um, but for high, high power output, we are down under 1.5 grams per kilowatt hour. And this means that we will, we actually, uh, from from the test data uh, from this engine installed in the boat, we see that we are under tier three limit of without any after treatment system, and that is cool. Greenhouse gas emission. Uh, we talked about this earlier also. Uh, the diesel, one kilowatt hour of diesel corresponds to 268 grams of CO2 <coughs> clean on the LNG fuel. Uh, one kilowatt hour of, of fuel uh, will uh, correspond to 198 grams and methanol 
249 grams for the same amount of energy. This means that going from diesel to methanol will, by definition, decrease our carbon footprint. Uh, and now we're not talking about renewable fuel, or we're, we're just comparing the, the, the energy content of, of the fuels. Uh, we have some potential methane slip, as we mentioned before, but, but this is something that could be uh, dealt with uh, in the combustion process. On board our pilot boat, we have a couple of systems installed. Together with Chalmers, uh, we will this uh, summer do some, uh, some um, emission tests. Uh, we, we use this uh, emission tester, a Chesto uh, non-NDIR process to get to know the uh, NOx uh, emissions. And uh, we, we're using uh, this particular matter, Cambastion DMS 500, uh, to measure the particular matter's emissions. And also we, we're using a, a mass meters for air and for fuel. Together with a strain gauge on the output shaft, we have all information uh, that we need. We can monitor this when we drive the driving boat. Uh, and with this, we have all the information we need to set everything in relation and get good answer, answers how the boat performs, how the emission performance uh, is when, when we drive. So, here comes a twist. No one thinks about working environment in a design phase like this, but we actually notice when we install the engine, the methanol engine the noise of the methanol engine is much lower. We started the engine and we could hardly feel it in the hull, the vibrations, and we could, uh, the, the, the sound level is a lot lower. So we decided to make a measurement of the decibels uh, in the engine room, just one meter from the engine. Uh, and that is what we did using a, a sound meter. Uh, we're using the decibel A, uh, which is the, the sound which you can, you can here with your ear. There are different ways of measuring decibels, but th this is how we did. Um, this is the diesel engine. This is the uh, methanol engine. Here is the decibels, and here is the RPM of the engine. Uh, with clutch engaged, which meaning that we're spinning the propellers uh, and spinning the output shaft. So this basically follows the, the propeller curve of the, of the uh, engine. So, uh, running the diesel engine with methanol engine shut off uh, gave us this curve, and the other way we did, we did the same procedure with the methanol engine, run the engine without the diesel engine running. Uh, and at 850 RPMs, uh, which is yeah, a bit more than idling, maybe five knots somewhere, some, somewhere there, uh, indicates that we're at 91 uh, decibels for the methanol engine. 97 somewhere decibels for the, uh, for the diesel engine. The difference here is 6 decibels. And for those of you who, do, who doesn't remember the logarithmic uh, curve for the, for, of decibels, I can tell you that uh, the, the, uh, this is four times more sound energy compared to, to this. So the, the diesel engine sounds four times as much as the methanol engine. And as we increase the RPMs uh, for the engines, uh, the curve starts to go together, and this is because the turbocharger starts to power up, uh, which, which oversounds the, the engines. But still, at the cruising speed of, nine, uh, of 10 knots for, a, for, a, for this pilot boat, uh, at 1200 uh, RPMs, there is still a quite big difference. We have a difference of uh, 95 to 99, it's four decibels, twice, still twice, twice the, the uh, sound energy uh, here compared to this one. Uh, and I hope that all of you will come and visit us in the boat uh, after this presentation. And uh, we will start up the boat and you can hear and feel, feel the vibrations and the difference between the, the two engines. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
take it out by the book. Du kan väl bara berätta hur det tar oss ut. Ja, okej. The boat is on the uh, Sjöklar pier. So the north pier from here, I think you can, you maybe see it. Because when you, when you leave this building, you can just go to the water and then go right. And you will see the boat. I think you can see the boat from the window here. It's a, yeah. It looks like this. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. We walk down the stairs, then go through the door, and uh, take your time with plenty of people who will look at the boats, and, and at one o'clock we should go back to the